Um, the next speaker is Dr. Pam Mosley Boss, who will be talking about CR39 and teaching us what she sees from co deposition. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about our CR39 results obtained using palladium deuterium co deposition. And Frank already talked to you about co deposition. But in specifically, I'm going to talk about the replication that was done by SRI under the supervision of Fran Panzella, <coughs> along with his student, uh, Ben Earl. Uh, they did a replication of our CR39 results, and you can see here the cell. It's inside their little uh, uh, plastic acrylic cage. And you can see that they have the magnets in place while the thing is plating out, which is against our usual protocol. This is a schematic of the cell. We have our platinum anode. We have a cathode, which is a silver wire, and they have the silver wire serpentine around the CR39 detector. And we also have our magnets, neodymium iron boron magnets, and the magnetic field inside that cell is 2,500 gauss. Now, the difference was that Ben forgot to take off the 60 micron thick polyethylene uh, uh, film between the CR39 detector. And so this film was between the detector as well as the cathode. And it turned out that was a good thing, as we'll see later. Uh, the lead curves indicate that the polyethylene cover will block 7 MeV alphas in lower energy, as well as 1.8 MeV protons. And the one thing about the detectors, they did two experiments, they called them 10.5 and 10.6, was that these were not, not only the most analyzed detectors in the history of, of uh, this, this field, but they were also the most traveled. So I sent the CR39 detectors to Fran from San Diego to SRI, which is near San Francisco. He did the experiment. The experiment lasted two weeks. He etched them. He sent them back to me for microscopic examination, back to San Diego. So I took them from San Diego, sent them to Washington, D.C., to Larry Forsley, who had them scanned. Larry sent them back to Fran, who then sent them to Russia, where they underwent sequential analysis. So these were the most traveled detectors in our history. So here's the result of our microscopic examination. You can see that there's lots of tracks there, even though we had the 60 micron polyethylene film between the cathode and the detector. And here you see what looks to be a, a triple track. Here we have two little, uh, little mouse little ears there. And you can see that they're breaking away from a center point. And Larry already showed you the rogues gallery of triple tracks. These triple tracks are indicative of neutrons with energies greater than 9.6 MeV, and these neutrons can cause the carbon atom to shatter into three alpha particles. And we had exposed uh, CR39 detectors to a DT neutron source, and you can see that there's different shapes, and these different shapes result from the fact that there are four different channels in which the carbon breakup reaction can occur. But you can see that ours match up exactly with what's been observed for DT neutrons. So if, if, if they look with, uh, like the a neutron shattering reaction, that that's what they are. In fact, you know, Han Frenji agreed that that's what they are. <coughs> so Fran took a photograph of the polyethylene film at the end of the experiment, as well as a photograph of the etched CR39 detector. He measured uh, the uh, resistance on either side of the polyethylene electrode and showed that the, the uh, Palladium had not gone through the polyethylene film, so the tracks that we see are not due to mechanical damage uh, of the dendrites piercing into the CR39 detector. And here are the scanned results here from the front as well as the back. And you can see that the tracks pretty much line up with where the position of the wires were. Here are the results of the scanning. This is a scanned image here with the uh, optics fo focused on the surface of the detector and deeper down the detector. And you see these bright spots. Uh, these bright spots indicate that these are nuclear generated tracks. This is the property of what you see for nuclear generated tracks. And the scanner identifies all the objects in that image and then does a bunch of algorithms to determine which tracks, which it positively identifies as tracks and which ones it throws out. And the green are the positively identified tracks. And here are the results of the scanned results here. We have the counts versus the major axis. We have a huge population of tracks here at about two micron size. And then we have another set of tracks here, second population. These cannot be due to alphas because that polyethylene film is going to block alphas, so energy is less than 7 M MeV. So probably due to other energetic uh, protons, other energetic alphas, as well as uh, neutrons. You can see the uh, minor versus major axis. We have some circular, preferably circular tracks as well as tracks that have some ellipticity. On the back side, again, we have that population of tracks at uh, uh, two microns. Uh, protons with energy greater than uh, 10 MeV can go all the way through a one millimeter thick C 
CR39 detector. And again, we have a population here of other tracks, uh, which are centered at 10 microns as opposed to 7 microns, and these are probably due to neutrons. Uh, the results of the sequential uh, etching done by uh, Lipson and Rosetsky shown here. Uh, after 21 hours of etching, they identified tracks due to 3 MeV protons, 16 MeV alphas, as well as 12 MeV alphas. And then Fran had done an experiment where they had the CR39 outside the cell with a 6 micron uh, mylar film separating the detector from the cathode. And Larry showed this yesterday and showed that they identified a nearly monochromatic mono chromatic uh, peak due to 2.45 Me du uh, neutrons. Well, about 2009, got a, was contacted by De Zhang Zhao of NASA. He saw, saw our papers, and he had been doing a lot of work with CR39 for the space station and had developed this LET spectrum analysis, and he said, hey, if you got any scanned data, can you send it to me and I'll do an analysis of it? And I said, sure, so I decided to send him the SRI data. And he did his LET analysis and he identified uh, tracks due to energetic protons as well as alphas from both the front and back side. So here is a, a blow up of the uh, protons and we were examining this, Larry and I, and we decided that these are probably due to protons from the DED reaction to give a proton and a triton. But Larry said, hey, what's causing this trough here? And, and here, you know, what, what's going on here? And, and I said, well, I think what's happening is that we're getting the secondary protons and they're radiating through the, the palladium and the silver and the, and the polyethylene <coughs> film and slowing down. He said, but that doesn't explain these troughs. And so he's saying this, these troughs are indicating that we're consuming these, these protons. So what's consuming them? So I looked at the system and said, okay, the candidates we have, we have heavy water, so we have deuterium and oxygen. We have the silver wire, we have lithium chloride present in the system, and we also have palladium. So which one of these candidates is causing uh, the consumption of these protons? So I looked in the literature, uh, it wasn't the lithium, it wasn't the chlorine, it wasn't the deuteron, deuterium, it wasn't the oxygen, it wasn't the silver. But I came across this paper here uh, from these folks, Journal Radio, Radio Analytical Nuclear Chemistry, and they were bombarding native palladium with protons of different energies, and here we're in the energy region we're interested in, between uh, 10 and 20 MeV, and they were showing that uh, reasonably high cross-section for the proton being taken up by the palladium, and it can either form 105 uh, silver or 106 uh, metastable silver. So what happens with these materials when they decay? Well, 105 silver has a half-life of 41.29 days and it'll decay back to palladium 105. So we'll see silver that decay, decays back to palladium. If you have 105 metastable silver, it will preferentially de decay back down to 105 silver and, and the half-life is very short, 7.23 minutes. If you have metastable 106 silver, it preferentially decays back to 106 palladium. <laughs> However, if you have 110 metastable silver, it will decay preferentially to cadmium, and we'll see silver that decays to cadmium. And then I recall that John Dash had reported on seeing that kind of, of decays. He had reported at ICCF10 and ICCF11, this was for bulk palladium before and after electrolysis, uh, he showed the presence of silver, and then 15 months later he looked at them again and saw cadmium in addition to the silver and also saw the same similar things with, with co-deposition. So the loss of protons that we're seeing could be due to the palladium taking it up, being converted into silver, which eventually goes back to cadmium. So the review of our analysis with the SRI detectors is that essentially we are seeing the same energetic products that are seen for uh, the primary and secondary reactions, and uh, different methods of analysis <coughs> yielded complementary results. So we've reported this at ICCF 17, and don't let that smile just deceive you. He asked a tough question. Mm -hmm. So we reported this at ICCF 17, and Peter raises his hands up and says, okay, what's the branching ratio? And I'm thinking, well, how the heck do I know? <laughs> but our saving grace was that Ben had the 60 micron polyethylene sleeve at present, which makes it possible to kind of figure out things so this is what the effect of a 60 micron polyethylene film does. 
Here's no polyethylene film, and you can see it's hopeless. There are all kinds of traps all over the place. But the polyethylene film blocks alphas with energies less than 7 MeV, blocks the 0.82 MeV helium-3, and the 1.01 MeV triton, and really reduces the number of tracks, which is why we've got such good scanned results. And we can also use the results of Zhao to figure out, you know, who's who. So on the back side, let's see, for, like I said in here, the 11 MeV protons will transfer to the one micron thick uh, CR39 detector and polyethylene film stuff. So these protons here are probably due to those very energetic protons. Okay. So we are saying that the alpha and the 0 to 9 MeV proton tracks that we see on the back side of the detector, uh, that, that, that these are both detectors, 643 tracks, are actually due to this reaction here, the DD going to helium 3 plus a neutron. We're saying that the front side alpha tracks that we see are actually due to long range alphas that were identified by uh, Lipson and Rosetsky. And that the alphas we see at the 1 to 7 MeV range are actually due to the 7 to 15 MeV alphas that have been slowed down as they go through everything. We're also saying that the front side proton tracks between 2.6 and 3.4 MeV are due to the protons due to the D plus D reaction going to a proton plus a triton. And the front side tracks, which number this, between 3.4 and 15 are MeV are due to the secondary uh, uh, reaction <coughs> where deuterium reacts with the helium-3 to form an alpha plus the energetic proton. And that these protons are then slowed down by the water, the palladium, and the PE film. So let's go to look at the back side. Uh, we have the D plus D primary reaction going to helium-3, which is blocked, and the neutrons. We have 643 tracks on the back side. Uh, this reaction will occur equally throughout the CR39, so you'll have the same number of tracks on the front side as you do on the back side. So this is the correct, so this is the corrected number of, of, of tracks front and back. The uh, efficiency of uh, CR39 for, pro for neutrons is the given here, 1.17 times 10 to the minus fourth. So our number of neutrons is 1.1 times 10 to the seventh. As confirmation, we look at the uh, analysis done by uh, Lipson and Rosetsky, where they did a sequential etching of the CR39 detector outside the cell, uh, they saw 248 DD neutron tracks. Uh, the efficiency, again, is given here. 30% uh, of the tracks are elliptical, so for one detector, that would be 3 time, 0.03 times 10 to the 6, but for two detectors, that'd be 6.06 .06 times 10 to the 6. So that's within ballpark of what uh, we get from the number from using uh, the results from Zhao. get at the, uh, this number here, we have 987, 9,873 tra tracks that are attributed to the uh, proton. Now this proton is going to be radiating through out the palladium film, so you have to take that into account. We also saw that the scanner counted about half the tracks, and taking into account the absorption of the charged particles as they go through the palladium film, the silver, uh, the, the polyethylene and into the CR39, we see that the proton will travel through 15 microns of palladium before it will reach the detector. Well, that silver palladium layer is about a millimeter thick, so the number of protons is off by this factor here, and when you take that factor into account, the number of protons is greater than this number here, and our estimated neutron-proton branching ratio is 8.3, and this is the maximum value because the number of protons has been undercounted. So, sanity check, we look at the results that Lipson reported in 2000 in fusion technology. They detected a number, or determined a number of uh, protons and tritons using CR39, as well as neutrons using a liquid <coughs> simulator detector. They had a silver palladium, palladium oxide heterostructure that they electrochemically uh, loaded, and they detected this number of neutrons, 19 times 10 to the minus 3 neutrons per second, and their protons were 4 times 10 to the minus 13 protons per second in 4 pi solid angle. And they estimated their neutron-proton ratio to be 4.75, and they also said that their protons were underestimated. So for all practical purposes, we're getting the same number as what Lipson and Rosetsky saw, and essentially are saying that the primary reactions are near unity. So what about the secondary reactions? 
Larry already talked to you about what the, the type of secondary reactions you get with the, with the neutrons that goes through the CR39. Mm -hmm. uh, these alphas are blocked. We saw two triple tracks uh, in the CR39 detectors. Uh, the efficiency for the DT neutrons is this number here. Uh, and that's actually the efficiency for all three of these reactions. What we found is that 3.38% 3 <coughs> of those DT generated tracks are actually triple tracks. So when you take that into account, this is the actual number of neutrons we saw. For the protons and the, the other secondary reaction, again, these alphas are blocked. Uh, these are the number of tracks that were identified. Uh, taking into account the uh, losses as the protons go through the palladium, this is the corrected number of tracks here. And so with the diff two different energies, 12.6 to 17.5 MeV protons, our range of protons is anywhere between 2.83 to 3.28 times 10 to the fifth. <coughs> So this is a summary of the branching ratios we have. We have this number of tritons, this number of protons, uh, the helium-3 and, and neutrons there. Uh, this just indicates that the primary reactions are approximately equal. And here we have the number for the uh, DT secondary reaction and the helium-3 deuterium secondary reaction. And this indicates that the DT reactions are slightly favored over the helium-3 deuterium reactions. And do we expect that to be the case? Turns out we do. Here we have uh, how far a triton can go through palladium. And you can see it can go through a lot further than helium-3 because it has a plus one charge versus a plus two charge. And it's also not as massive. But if we look at the cross sections of the reaction, we see that the DT reaction is favored over the helium-3 deuterium reaction. So we expect more DT reactions than the D helium-3 reactions to occur. Uh, so again, here we have our summary. One other point to make out is that we have formed 1.32 times 10 to the 6 tritons, and we have here 1.18 times 10 to the 6 uh, uh, neutrons, DT neutrons formed. This indicates that most of our tritons are getting consumed. Uh, have we ever seen a, a reported loss of tritium? Well, actually, we have. Bakker says reporting seeing loss of tritium during co-deposition. He reported this at ICCF3. He found out that when he used Isotec D2O, which is low tr tritiated D2O, he would see increases in tritium in both the uh, solution and gas phase. The dashed lines are what you expect uh, from theory. Uh, this is what he measured. But when he went to Cambridge D2O, which is highly tritiated, here's what you expect theoretically. He saw a loss of tritium. And it, it, this was true out of six out of nine experiments. And at ICCF-17, the Koreans reported uh, the same results using closed systems. So when they had low tritiated D2O, they saw an increase in tritium in their solutions. When they had high tritiated D2O, they saw a loss. So at ICCF-17, Serena Vossen said that he thought that the uh, new elements observed in transmutation were actually due to fissioning of the palladium. And Larry showed you some of these results yesterday. I have to agree with that. Uh, for one thing, uh, when we expose the uh, palladium to a magnetic field, the Lorentz forces cause the deposit to form these star-like features. And when you look at EDX, you see here, uh, you see a little tiny palladium peak, and you see these larger peaks due to the iron and aluminum, chromium, and nickel. Uh, the distribution of these new elements was inhomogeneous. And these same elements have been reported by others. So the big question has always been, is this, are these new elements the result of multi-body deuteron fusion or the disintegration of the palladium lattice? Well, in my opinion, given the, the relative size of the palladium to the other peaks, I think it's uh, fission. Here are different spots on the same cathode. Here you see this, the deposit looks pretty much like our normal cauliflower part and deposit, and you can see that it's all pretty much pure palladium. But here, this area looks more centered, and you can see that this is where we get all our new elements present here. <coughs> and the smoking gun are these long-range alphas. Uh, looking into the literature, the only source for these long-range alphas are fission. So in conclusion, the CR39 detectors we've used in our co-deposition experiments show that we have uh, the, the same products uh, seen in hot fusion, the protons, the tritons, uh, the alphas, and the, and the neutrons. And uh, 
the uh, branching ratio of the primary reactions is close to unity. The DT reactions are favored over the, over the helium-3 deuterium reactions, and transmutation is probably the result of fissioning of the palladium nucleus, and this is supported by the observations of the long-range alphas. And I'd like to thank Mitchell and Gail and Peter for organizing this uh, colloquium. Peter for asking hard questions. Uh, Frank, Larry, and Dr. Kim for their support. Stan Schmock for developing the co-deposition protocol. Fran and Ben for doing the replication. And my husband and our kids for putting up with years of revolving schedules around my experiments. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Turn the lights on. Oh, okay, what's your hard question this time? What's my assignment this time? Um, I enjoyed your presentation um, a lot, and um, I, I'm not going to um, apologize then for asking all my hard questions. <laughs> so, my question today um, uh, basically, two thoughts. One thought is Did you double check the yield fractions for? Uh, uh, one MeV uh, triton in a palladium dewdrop. So the issue, years ago people were thinking that if you accelerated the deuteron to high enough energy, then if it goes into deuterium gas or palladium deuterite or something, then the yield ratio, if it's high enough, will allow you to make a, a reactor, a very simple kind of reactor, because you get more energy out than you put in if the yield ratio is high enough. So we calculated the yield ratios for deuterium, and they're not high enough to sustain um, a, a reactor. So the, the issue of the yield ratio is, is, is one that's sort of close to my heart. And uh, I recall that the DT cross-section is really very high, so that's very encouraging. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm kind of not remembering that the yield ratio for uh, one MEV triton is all that particularly high. So, uh, well, yeah. for example, if the yield ratio were like 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3, then that would give you 14 MeV neutrons that will, you know, down from your other reactions. And in, in a sense, this is the calculation that Rusetsky went through um, when he was trying to figure out if he was getting the right number of 14 MeV uh, neutrons. So, that, that's my question. So, Yield ratio to try to talk about, and, uh, and can be checked off. Well, I, I don't think the yield ratio is near one. Well, you know, th given that when the triton is born inside the palladium deuterium lattice and it's fully loaded and it's zipping through there, and it, got, it can go quite a ways 43 microns I showed there, and it's going through 10,000 unit cells, it's got good odds of hitting a deuterium. And again, the cross-section is as high. Well, if, if you think about it, if, if what you said is uh, true, then you've got, you can file a patent on a new kind of reactor. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you load up your target with uh, deuterium. You get an accelerator, you take tritium, and you accelerate it to one MeV, which you can do with, I don't know, 60 to 80% efficiency. Now you get, um, you get all kinds of energy out. You get uh, uh, 20 uh, MeV uh, energy from having put in one MeV of uh, kinetic energy for your triton. So <coughs> now you can power the world just by accelerating tritium into deuterium. So mm -hmm. in, in a sense, because people don't do that, you know that the yield fraction sort of has to be below 1 in 20. And I think it's a lot lower than that, but I'm not sure. I well, it's just based on the numbers we got from Zhao's analysis and our microscopic well, analysis. Your, your numbers are good, it's, and, and, and your experiments are great. The, the issue is the interpretation. The, the interpretation, the conclusion I come is that come with, uh, from your data is that the number of 14 MeV neutrons is, is more than can be accounted for from your DD reaction. So, so okay. All right. Well, I know that Zhao looked at at possibility because another way to get uh, energetic, to, another way to shatter the carbon is, is through an energetic proton. But that the proton had to be what 20 <coughs> MeV was yeah, it? Yeah, it had to be over 20 MeV, and it, we don't have energetic protons enough to do it. So the DTs is the only source. have to be from the neutrons. 
But it's fine that they're from the neutrons. The only question is whether the neutrons are from DT reactions or you get DT reactions at the rate you'd expect from the yield uh, fraction for uh, the 1 MeV tritone. Right. But the other 14 MeV neutrons have to be from some other process. But that's the question. What other process gives rise to that? That's the hallmark of an easy fusion. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, Peter, it's more than that because we previously measured and published and showed that we had a range from 12 and a half to about 15 and a half MeV, which just again brackets that reaction yeah. that half. Uh, I was going to point out that if you, uh, other than how you created it, if you created a, a what's called a Bohr state, a nuclear cell, so if you put in some energy, it decays through all available decay modes. So it's like you've got hot nuclear matter and wants to shut, uh, dump its energy. So, so it sheds it. It sheds it. So for example, if you have a gamma photo disintegration of a voiding nucleus, for example, you, you can establish spore state. So it gets rid of alphas, and alphas are sort of the range that you're measuring. It gets rid of protons, and the protons are sort of the range you're measuring. It gets rid of neutrons, and neutrons are sort of in the range that you measure. So that kind of thing, namely, your, your fast alphas, from my perspective, have to come with the fast protons and the fast neutrons. So the, the issue is, is how many fast alphas do you have relative to how many fast neutrons? That, that's, and, and also fast protons. That's the ratio that to me is, is the really interesting ratio. So that, that, that's the hallmark problem. No, actually, that, that ratio is calculable from what we've got, but it, ha it raises an issue with the International Space Station and space dust symmetry, because I am arguing right now with Zhao that they have misinterpreted as alphas, or in fact neutrons, and they were unaware of the work that Gary Phillips had done prior to our coming along with this, the point comes down to we can differentiate the two by the ellipticity of the tracks. And so there's another set of analysis of this data which has been analyzed to death, to be reanalyzed to death again. And the question you just raised is one I hadn't thought of, but now you've pointed out the importance of it. You, you guys have made such good progress on this problem. I'm, I'm very pleased and very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> can I now say there's the beef?